Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking around to your presentation. Um, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, we're group nine and we are, uh, well, we're improving PV output forecasts by incorporating smart meter data of other photovoltaic systems in the area. And uh, we were a rather small team of five. Uh, and the problem really, well, the, this project really arose from a problem that is, uh, that, that I had in my experience with working in microgrids and aggregators uh, is uh, in that very short term forecasting or um, also called now casting techniques are usually not uh, powerful enough to, to well, make accurate forecasts to, um, for once, arbitrage with batteries or uh, electric vehicles. So make money to store energy when it's cheaper, selling it when it's more expensive, or providing ancillary services. So that's uh, frequency regulation or voltage control of the, of the grid. And um, well, there are co the common methods are really persistence uh, or machine learning algorithms like the LSTM or time series algorithms like Sorima. Uh, and we we would have we would like to contribute with our work to uh, to those methods of short very short term forecasting. Um, so the project idea to uh, summarize it's a kind of a peer to peer photovoltaic uh, forecasting. Uh, you, you're essentially using lag values of other nearby stations upstream of wind to improve your forecast at a at a center site uh, denoted here in in orange on this on the graphic on the right. And uh, the this has been done, um, but the contribution of our project is really to to do this with machine learning and also include a smart feature selection based on the wind speed and direction, the distance between systems and also the cloud type. So um, this, this was our goal to, to when we started off on Monday. The data that we had was a PV data in Reading and the resolution was 30 minutes. So we had a measurement every 30 minutes for six different sites. And we had one year of data from 2020 to 2021. Uh, and uh, that was the PV data. And then on the other hand, of course, we needed the weather data for that region. And we were using the uh, reanalysis error five hourly resolution data uh, for a specific uh, window that included Reading. Uh, and we were interested in wind speed, wind direction and global radiation. And we also had the matching year in that data set that we had for the PV data. So diving into this, uh, the spatial distribution of these systems, we had, we chose one center system in red here. That's the Edith Morley building, uh, university building here. And then we had two other relevant uh, peripheral systems as we call them. Uh, that's the Museum of English Rural Life here in the North. And then in the bottom, this is a family dwelling um, with, a, with a PV system installed on the rooftop. And um, yeah, again, thanks, thanks a lot, Hannah, for um, for really making this happen. Otherwise, we wouldn't have data for for this project. So uh, the workflow of this week was well. First, we collected the data, we resampled and merged. We detected some outliers, as you can see here on the on the right, um, on the top being with a with two rather large outliers, bottom. It's cleaned. Um, we created a main data frame that included both the PV and the weather, weather features. Um, then we selected regression algorithms that we would like to implement and compare. Uh, we selected the center station. So again, this station in the middle here. Um, and then, yeah, we developed the station selection algorithm based on the wind direction and conceptualized the lag selection algorithm. And the lag selection algorithm is essentially how far in the, into the past do we want to take the values from the other stations? And that really depends on how far they are for one and all, how far they are from the center station. And on the other hand, how fast 
the wind is blowing. Um, and we, we started thinking about how we would implement this. Uh, haven't, haven't implemented it yet due to our rather coarse resolution of data being 30 minutes, um, but I'll get to that later. And then, yeah, of course, we tested and compared the performance to benchmark uh, models that we created. So I'll go into the station selection. Uh, that's the approach. We essentially, if we look back to this map, we have all of the systems aligned in, well, one line, you could say. And uh, well, that that is quite useful for the limited amount of uh, system data that we have. Uh, so our selection approach, and this can be, of course, expanded to uh, to many more distributions of systems, is to create a dummy variable for the wind direction. And the dummy variable is one uh, whenever the wind direction is aligned with the system alignment. So the, the line that the systems are located on and um, else the dummy is zero. So you would, you would have different models for different wind directions. Um, and of course, it's not, it's not always just, um, you wouldn't go for an exact line. You'd have a, a kind of a spread um, of, of that. Um, and, and we, well, then you would train different models for uh, different wind directions. In our case, we just had one line. So we just uh, had to train one model here. And then uh, when forecasting, um, first the wind direction is checked of the, of the forecast of the, the wind direction data. So from some weather forecast service, and then I, uh, uh, well, the, the matching model is chosen and used for forecast. And well, we, we chose three different algorithms, the um, multi-layer perceptron, random forest and the boost decision tree. And uh, most, most uh, runs the, the MLP outperformed the others 13 out of 15 times. We use a three layer uh, architecture, 100, 100 nodes, 80 nodes, and then um, converging to one to, to get that discrete forecast. So that regression, we used the activation function ALU and a, um, well, the, the error term was the, was the medium average error. Um, and, and uh, well, we had, excuse me, we had three benchmark models that we wanted to compare our models to. First being just using the solar radiation so that's just using one feature for regression. The second is just using the, well, using the solar radiation, the SSRD, which is the same as here. These are the same, but with the 30 minute lag from the same station. And then also using the benchmark, third benchmark is not using the lag from the same station, but actually using the lags from the other stations. and. Um, and then the two models that we that we wanted to compare these benchmarks to, or rather compare the models to the benchmarks, is um, a black box model where we include uh, the solar radiation and the lags from the other stations, the wind direction and the wind speed. So just each one of those as features, uh, hoping that the the model will make sense of it, um, since a sense of the relationships between the features and the target variable. And uh, secondly, uh, this implementation of the station selection algorithm that we saw here. So um, these are some results that we have. So um, overall, which was, well, quite surprising, the black box actually outperformed uh, the station selector. The, this is, this can, in, in, in both the, it, both the root mean squared error skill. So, um, divided by the mean of the true values uh, and also uh, based on the mean absolute error. Um, the, the reason for this is, uh, it's, is most likely explained because actually you have more feet, you're using more features here. And so you're, you're basically, you just have a better fit because you're, you're, you, you have more parameters for the model. So, um, and, and it's, as we can see, this this benchmark two was the one where we just included the surrounding station lag variables without the wind, and we see the similar performance. We actually don't see a um, a drastic increase though from this uh, inc 
inclusion of the wind variables. Um, and the other two benchmarks, they were um, they were worse. And here, here's a sample day of the, in blue, you'll see the true values uh, in, in orange on the very bottom is just this regression on the weather data on the solar radiation. And then uh, on top you have the lag, if the lag terms, and this is very, um, well, common, of course, when you use lags that you have kind of this shift between the peaks whenever it's uh, more less volatile. And I'll speak on that in a second. Um, so yeah, this, this now for some conclusions and uh, for the discussion of these results, we, we didn't really, um, test our hypothesis and main main um, or we, we didn't uh, validate our hypothesis rather. And the main reason for that is, well, that we have 30 minute data. And of course, for one that shows little volatility. So you're not seeing those little clouds that you would like uh, to, to um, infer from other stations to the, to the center station. Um, and this is just a very quick calculation. Well, we had the average wind speed in the air is actually nine meters per second. And for a, uh, for a time frame of 30 minutes, that's 16 kilometers if a cloud would move with that speed. Um, and the stations are actually only separated by two kilometers. So this, um, so, so to repeat the cloud would move six, eight, eight times farther than actually the stations being apart in that 30 minutes window. Um, other, other uh, limitations and uh, worth uh, point worth discussing is this, um, that we had actually just two peripheral systems, one north, one south. And um, that the, this, this had um, us limit our data size. So we actually were only able to use one 80th of the data for that uh, wind corridor, that wind uh, angle. Um, yeah, of course we didn't, we didn't have, um, a lot of data due to that. So having more than one year worth of data could, could, uh, along, uh, um, uh, also while also having finer resolution, higher resolution data would really help us, um, validate our approach. Uh, and the third thing is, is not really a, um, is not pr pertaining so much to this project, but. It's something that is seen a lot in forecasting and should be kept in mind when you're just using historic data to train and validate your models. And this is really that um, when you're using lags, you're only able to forecast, well, a very limited uh, forecast horizon uh, because after a while you're actually forecasting on lags that are themse in themselves forecast. So um, this, is, this is really a, a quite a mistake that is often seen that people do day ahead forecasts with, with a couple of lag variables. And they, of, of course, in, in reality, if you're using future data, you don't have those lag variables. Those lag variables would be predictions themselves and uh, that would cause a lot of error propagation. And uh, in some cases, really a divergent behavior of, of your results. Um, yeah, that, thanks for, Thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking around and happy to take any of your questions now. Great, thanks very much, Nicolas, and con uh, congratulations to group nine. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so it seems like there's, um, uh, it seems like with, with more data, there's a lot of scope for kind of experimenting to find the kind of the right combination of scales, right? So you need, you know, you need your kind of, um, you need your spatial and, and temporal scales to kind of match up with the with the conditions, don't you? In a sense, with the kind of the time scale of, of events yeah. and things. And exactly. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And like, I wonder, you know, how much um, there's loads of stuff to learn here. I think about kind of what's, you know, what's what's predictable and on what time scale, right? If you're looking at, um, you know, evolution over the next few hours, you know, how much of the changes in the clouds are predictable and on what what scales and things like that. So. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Great, um, brilliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are some think. questions, I think. Yeah. From... Yeah. Question from Dan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for that. It's very interesting. We're just on the scales thing. We're exploring similar stuff at the moment, but 
with our 30 minute data, we're looking at GSP regions. So sort of 20 to 50 kilometers square and looking at how neighboring GSPs affect each other. We're using very simple methods. Um, how easy would it be to use your, your technique with 400 different individual sites? Um, it, it would be very easy, but it would take some time to, to train. So um, for us, we were, in this case, we just had 2000 lines of data, rows of data, and we were using about six features, so six columns, um, which is, is and, and that runs in, I don't know, in, in a second or so, two seconds on my computer. Um, but of course, those algorithms, they don't, they don't scale linearly um, with, so, so, but it's, I mean, with something like Jasmine, we didn't have to resort to Jasmine, uh, Jasmine, but something like Jasmine or um, even uh, the, the ingenious distributed computing uh, idea from the last group, I think it, it's very tractable. I mean, yeah. And, but of course the, the, co the code is on GitHub. So it, you're, you're uh, free to look at it and I, I, I'd also help you with it if you, if you need help. That would be great. Thank you. Great, uh, Stephen. Oh, it's an inter interesting idea. Um, yeah, I, I, unless I got this wrong, you had several sites. Um, you were using them all as inputs, I guess. Um, did you look into maybe removing some of the, the solar, solar sites and what, what happens when you do that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we had, we had six initially and we just removed the ones that were, uh, well, we removed the ones that were uh, missing a lot of data uh, and the ones that were close to other uh, sites that had more robust data. So we didn't want to uh, overload our model with kind of the same time series uh, as features. Uh, so, so that's why we ended up just using uh, two features. So one on, the bottom, uh, one on the top of the center station and one of the, on the bottom. Um, but it, Honestly, I would I would love to try this uh, with with a lot of different sites as features that are spread out, uh, kind of equidistantly along the lines, or or even if there's a kind of a grid of them, and I would love to try that. Um, yeah, within one of those uh, kind of weather windows that that one wind speed and one wind direction is is uh, forecast for. So that I, I think is 25 kilometers in one and the other direction and would love to try a more densely, uh, dense mesh of, of systems. Okay. Great, okay. Uh, sorry, I've opened a window in front of this window so <laughs> I can't see uh, any other questions from anyone. Uh, great. Okay, so um, really brilliant to hear uh, about all your results, everybody, and to see really nice presentations. Amazing to think these are projects that didn't exist a few days ago uh, and to have come all this way to have these, these presentations is, is, is really incredible. So, um, so thank you all for, for your work and for, for putting these together.